good day. Today we will talk a little bit about Carax and the specific Carax. Many uh, viewers of the sister channel have seen lots and lots of uh, videos dedicated to the construction of this uh, particular model. There's nothing wrong with the model. There's nothing wrong with the quality of the kit from which the model was uh, put together. In fact, they're both very well done, but the design of this vessel, on the other hand, let's be polite and say that this is the one that I really love to hate. The list of things that are wrong with the design of this so-called Carrack model is so long that I could write a doctoral dissertation on it. Except I already have one. So, where do we begin the conversation? First of all, a little bit of background history of how the model was designed. It was designed based on um, iconography. Essentially, it was a graffiti scratched on a silver plate found in a church in the city of Dubrovnik in Croatia, the old Ragusan Republic. Nice and dandy. But the problem with iconography is that it should be taken always with a grain of salt, putting it mildly. And there are some things that graffiti are intended to do and some things that they are not intended to do. They are not intended to be technical drawings. And therefore, what they represent is no more than whoever, the view of whoever scratched the graffiti, of how they interpreted what they had seen or imagined to have seen on the water. This subject on which I have uh, frequently spoken to my students and to colleagues, and it is a subject that unfortunately pops up again and again and again. Iconographers love to see all sorts of things on a simple graffiti. Sometimes they see proportions, they see dimensions, they, the only thing that they have not yet claimed to have seen is the DNA of the captain and owner of the ship, but I'm sure this is forthcoming eventually. So what specifically are my arguments with this kit? As I already mentioned, the list is long and uh, pretty strong. Starting first of all with the hull. After all, this is the thing that I am most interested in and well, reasonably qualified to discuss. Look at the vessel. Look at the forecastle, look at the stern castles, look at the depth in hold. To paraphrase something that came up in the investigation after the sinking of Vasa in 1628, one of the conclusions that the observers came to was that the ship didn't have enough belly. And that is even more true for this vessel. There is a lot of the ship above the water and there is nothing under the water. In other words, my point is that such a vessel could never float, ever. Therefore, it would have never been designed this way. She has significantly rounded sides. They seem to be arcs of a circle, which is nice and dandy, except that this is not how the ships were built in the Adriatic. We have enough treatises surviving from the later 15th century when characters begin to appear in the record to know how the Venetian, the Eastern Mediterranean tradition of shipbuilding actually operated. We have enough sketches left from this period to know what a ship like this would have roughly looked like. Not enough to do a technical analysis, this is still the prerogative of maritime archaeology, but just enough to know that such a shallow uh, hull is impossible, just enough to know that the Fatex would never have been with this shape as it is on this one. Continuing with the same thing. We have something that probably is not visible on the camera, but would be visible if we could uh, look at the model from the top. So go to the sister channel and have a look there. The stern of the vessel is pinched in, longitudinally. It's very full and rounded in the forward one, and then has almost reverse curvature right around this area here. Not easy to plank, not likely to have been an original feature of such a vessel. The same is true also for the lower part of the hull. 
Another issue. Look at the forecastle, how short it is. The waist of the ship is more or less the right size. However, it is extending too far forward. It should have been moved farther back. The forecastle should be much longer than it is here. They have uh, made it a three-story high versus two-story highs in the back, but there is no proportion to what the overall dimensions of the ship actually are or were supposed to be. It will be found that this is excessive for such a fairly small carrack as this one is. Moving on to my criticism of the rig of the vessel. I would start, first of all, with the mizzenmast. The mizzenmast is too far forward. The mizzenmast is located where it should be located if the ship had four masts rather than three masts. In the stern here, there is an opening. I managed to persuade uh, the master modeler who put this one together not to position the bumpkin that is existing on the drawings of the model because it is ridiculous and because it has no business being there in the first place. It exists only if there was a fourth mast, but with this mizzen, with a single mizzen, without a Bonaventure mast, there is no reason for the bunkin. And then the mizzen is too far forward. It should be on the poop deck at the very end of the vessel because the task of the mizzen sail is not to add speed or anything else. This is essentially a steering sail. The job of this sail is to balance the huge active and inactive sail area of the bow of the vessel in bringing the bow into the wind and allowing the ship to tack. And before any one of you jumps and tells me that square riggers rarely tacked and mostly warship, I beg to differ. This may be true for the late, late 18th century. Reading through the logbooks, you do see possibly more references to wearing, especially when it is a whole fleet in uh, keeping station. But in the earlier periods, all the way through the 17th century, read through the logbooks, everywhere the ships are tacking and only upon occasion wearing. Tacking was the preferred way of changing course throughout the 17th century, which would rather suggest that these vessels were quite good at doing this uh, operation. The same would be true with the carrack. But if the carrack is properly rigged, not for this one. The mizzen is so far forward that it would not have the lever to turn the bow into the wind and keep it there until it crosses the eye of the wind and can the order of mainsail hull be given and continue on to the new tack. Other things here are a matter of interpretation. I see no reason why there is no fore topsail on the carrack. She certainly could have carried one. There is no reason why not to. Presumably this is how the illustration on the plate in the church was done. And that's why the designer of the kit, who by the way is not the same person as the manufacturer, uh, designed it. Again, I'll repeat the manufacturing. The quality of the kit is excellent. It is the design that I'm questioning. So it is, uh, if anyone, I'm criticizing the designer, not the manufacturer. I would like to underline this very, very thickly. And after all, the person was a ship modeler. He was not a maritime historian, not a ship archaeologist. So even in that case, it is quite understandable that things are not quite as they should be. While we are discussing this, let me enter upon another pet peeve of mine. Namely, why, why, oh why do ship modelers insist on building models of ships that either did not exist, Black Pearl anybody, or we know nothing about. Santa Maria builders, I'm looking at you. Why on earth, when we have enough other vessels that exist, that are documented completely and beautifully? What about the Red Bay Galleon, for example? Actually, it was a carrack, it was not a galleon, it was a now, the whaling ship from 1565, uh, identified by the colleagues from Parks Canada. 
Robert Grenier and his colleagues excavated it in the late 70s. They produced a beautiful publication that came out in the tail end of the 1990s. It is available, or at least was available, both in English and French. Since it is a Canadian publication, it is oblig uh, obligatory to be published in both languages at the same time. The, if you put aside some of the interpretations of the design methods of the vessel, the hauling in, out, up, down, and in all other directions possible of the fatics that are described there, there is enough information for a beautiful model to be built. And the only model I'm aware of that was built was by the Canadian archaeologists who researched the vessel and produced the reconstruction. But that is a real ship. It existed. We know the history. There is a five-volume publication of the, that vessel. No kits of it, no ship models produced. On the other hand, that garbage thing, uh, Santa Maria, I don't think there is a kit manufacturer who does not have a Santa Maria, of which we know absolutely Ground bottom zero. PA for that. I cannot claim to be the first one to come up with this criticism of uh, the Santa Maria models around the world. This actually belongs to the American naval architect turned maritime historian Howard Chappelle. He wrote an entire article that was published many, many moons ago in the Nautical Research Journal, specifically on the subject of models that should never be built. And that would be high on the list, Santa Maria. As far as characters, what other characters do we know? Real ones, of which we have information. There is the Mary Rose, which, if you Google my name, you will see that I have written some uh, sharp criticism on part of the publication of that vessel. And yes, I stand by every word that I said back in that publication. The how was never properly finished the documentation. The two people who knew how to do it, Chris Dobbs, Jonathan Adams, uh, for a variety of reasons, were not allowed to complete the documentation, reconstruction and publishing. So more work needs to be done, but at least the overall shape, we do have enough of that vessel. Then there is the Mars, the Swedish warship of the mid 16th century, half of which survives in fairly good condition. And I do know, happen to know that a uh, motion for the reconstruction of the vessel is underway at the present moment. There is the Elefanten, another ship of the same period, again Swedish, that survives to the gun deck. Then there is another from the late 15th century, Gripshunden, that is studied by both Maris of Södertörn University and also by Lund University. At the same time, that has phenomenal hull preservation. Once these investigations of Carax uh, are completed, there will be no excuse for any fictitious Carax to be designed and modeled. So, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for watching this. Thank you so much for listening to my uh, rant on the subject. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in another video. Thank you very much.